Advent, if you don't know, is the season when we prepare ourselves to receive God's gift of Jesus. It's a time of getting ready for the celebration of Christmas. The mood of Advent is that of longing, expectation, and waiting. Advent is a time when we yearn for Jesus to come back to completely remake all things as the returning king. The cry of Advent is of those who have experienced injustice in the world under the curse of sin, and yet who have hope of deliverance from the God who hears and is not silent. Advent is a time to repent and believe with all of our hearts. There are four Sundays of Advent here in 2022. Next Sunday, December the 4th, we will light the hope candle. And then on Sunday, December 11th, we'll light the candle of love. And then on Sunday, December 18th, we'll light the candle of joy. And then on Wednesday night, December 21st, during our candlelight service, we will light the, joy, uh, the candle of peace. And then Sunday morning, Christmas morning, December the 25th, we will light the Christ candle. So we'll celebrate the entire month of December beginning next Sunday. Okay. George, yes, what sir. do you have? I've got a verse here out of Psalm uh, 68, verse 4. It says, Sing to God, sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. So what are we going to start out with today, Catfish? Number 430. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4.
six, solid rock. D solid rock. that you bestow upon us each and every day. With that, we open our hearts and our, give back to you in a way that is pleasing and to thy sight. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Jesus, Jesus, now I trust. 
stages. Birth it means we're born spiritually, in other words, born again. And then we grow, or at least all Christians are supposed to grow. Some do, some don't. So you have birth, you have growth, and then finally there's maturity. God expects us to grow up. Some never, ever mature. <clears throat> Here's what I think. If you want to grow spiritually, you have to have a desire to grow. And if you desire growth, it can't happen. How? Let me share a few things with you. If you want to grow, if you don't want to grow, you might as well lean over and take a nap. But if you want to grow spiritually, let me suggest a few verses you can hang your hat on. 
I'm going to use three verses this morning, and they are not together, so you might want to write down the verse. First Peter chapter 2, verse 2. First Peter 2.2, 2, here's what it says. Like newborn babies, we should desire the pure milk of the word so we might grow. We need proper food to grow physically. It's the same spiritually. There is so much out there that doesn't help our bodies, doesn't promote good physical growth. It's junk. That's why some people refer to it as junk food. You can fill yourself up with the wrong things. And we can also fill ourselves up spiritually with the wrong things. There's violence. You find it on the movie screen, television, video games. Turn on the news. You can find violence anywhere. And we fill ourselves with too much violence. We can also fill ourselves with too much entertainment. Too much entertainment. That's a huge scope of stuff. But you can fill yourself with so much entertainment for yourself that you don't have room for anything spiritually. And of course you can fill yourselves with immorality. Immorality. It's easy to do. Go to the same things I mentioned a moment ago. Go to movies, television, concerts, whatever. You can get so full of immorality, spiritual things can't even work their way into your life. All of those things will keep us from growing spiritually. I wrote down three things or four, that might help us grow. I believe a strong devotional life will help you grow spiritually. I would recommend starting each day with God. I love the quote of the old cowboy who says, I always throw my boots under the bed at night. That way in the morning I have to get on my knees to pull them out. And then it reminds me when I'm on my knees what I ought to be doing. Start each day with God. Here's some suggestions. Try quoting a scripture every morning. You say, well, Dallas, I don't know one. Learn one. <laughs> That's a challenge, isn't it? It's just one. There are several in the Bible. <laughs> just pick one out. Learn one. Read a Bible verse every day. You say, I don't have a Bible. Come talk to me. I'll get you a Bible. Try thinking godly thoughts every day. Every day. Try forgiving someone before you go to bed tonight. Wow, it's getting tough now. <laughs> Try forgiving someone. Think of something you can do for somebody else. Those are things that help you grow spiritually. Guaranteed. Secondly, I believe we should allow others to feed us. In Hebrews 10.25, Hebrews 10.25, it says we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. 
as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. That means the day of the Lord approaching. It's coming sooner today than it was yesterday. It's getting closer. This is basically, I think, talking about the church. We should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. I believe the church, being part of a church, is part of the maturing process. I believe church attendance is vital to growth. Church attendance. There's a sign out in the outdoor foyer up there. Some need to read. If I'm sick and I have to stay home and watch a service on the computer or on TV, I can't do that very long. And it's because my heart yearns for fellowship, to be with people, to be with godly people, and to grow with those people. You can't do that on the computer. Most churches have gifted people. We do. We are very blessed with gifted people, and those gifted people ought to be in place to where they can feed others. You take a little bitty baby lamb, if it doesn't get fed, what happens? <clears throat> See, we have people coming here to other churches and they die <laughs> spiritually before we ever even start with them. And it's because they don't have people who are trying to feed them. We need those kind of people. I would challenge you to be one. By the way, the word exhort in that verse is the same thing as the word encourage. People in church are supposed to encourage each other. Simple as that. Don't hold this against me, but I'm going to use it. Because uh, I'm a recovering alcoholic. And to be real honest with you, if you divided my life between my old life and my new life, I spent a lot more of my old life so far then I had my new life. I probably spent more time in bars than I have in church. With that in mind, let me share something with you that a guy wrote. He said the neighborhood bar is possibly the best counterfeit there is to the fellowship that Christ wants in his church. It's an imitation of the church. Dispensing liquor instead of grace. Escape rather than reality. But it is a permissive, accepting, and inclusive fellowship. You can tell people secrets that they don't tell other people. The bar flourishes not because most people are alcoholics, but because God has put into our hearts the desire to know and to be known. Hello, Bart. To love and be loved. Hello, Bart. And we can have all of that for the price of a few beers. I believe with all of my heart that Christ wants his church to be like those bars, a fellowship 
where people can come in and say, I'm sunk, I'm beat, I've had it, and someone will care. Alcoholic Anonymous and groups like that seek to have those qualities. And they do a very good job. And so I've shared with you the, the positives of the bar. Sometime I'll give you a list of negatives. Bars can be positive. Alcoholics Anonymous can be positive. Too often, though, our churches are not. Churches, by the way, also give us opportunities of service, and if we take advantage of them, they will help us grow. You hear what I'm saying? There are opportunities of service in the church. We have people here who do a tremendous amount. We have people that aren't doing anything. This church will be beautifully decorated by next Sunday because four ladies have taken it upon themselves to do the decorating. Praise the Lord. I love it. We've got a precious member who's in charge of all of the printing. Let me give you a fair warning right now. You better hang on to this bulletin because it's going to be over a month before she's back. Who's going to take that? Who wants to step up and do that? You see, we need backups in all positions. Who's going to take? What if Catfish isn't here? What if George isn't here? Who's going to volunteer and say, I'll leave the singing. I'll do it. Michelle is in total charge of the kitchen. Thank you, Michelle. But what if Michelle is not here? Who's going to volunteer to step up? We start Advent next week. You know who's going to light all those candles? Ain't going to be me. I need volunteers. I need people to come up to me or my wife and say, I'll do an Advent candle. Here's how hard it is. We'll give you a script to read. Most of the time, the women read better than the men. And then the man goes down, or a woman, and lights a candle. And then the man, we don't want to leave him out, or a woman, Say a prayer. You say, oh, I don't know how. Yeah, you do. Just say, Lord, thank you for everything. And go sit down. I need volunteers. Who's going to do that? We have a lady who cleans the church. If she's sick, who's going to back her up? Nobody's volunteering to. We have places in the Sunday school that we can use people. Why doesn't somebody come up and say, if you need help in Sunday school, anytime, call me. I'll help. I could go on. I don't think you want me to. <laughs> when you volunteer and you do stuff like that, God will give you the opportunity to feed other people. It's not about food. 
It's about spiritually feeding. And when you volunteer for stuff, there's a satisfaction that I can't explain. But I believe it's the Lord in your spirit saying, that's what you need to be doing. Step out for me. I've done enough for you. Do something for me. You know, a lot of times we learn from the examples of other people. There may be people looking at you as an example. Be an example. No struggle or family issue is unique to one person. I'm going to tell you what. When this church is pretty well full, you can be guaranteed there are some godly people. But you can also be guaranteed that some have gone through a divorce, some have had a child die, some have lost their job, some have lost their spouse, etc., etc., etc. In other words, there are others in the body of Christ who have already gone through what you might be going through. These people can offer godly advice. You need to get it from them. And then next, you need to grow. You got to learn how to walk. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. The Bible says to grieve not the spirit. Grieve not the spirit. It means that when we sin against other people by lying and criticizing and slander and anger, you grieve the Holy Spirit. You say, I don't know what that means. He may be mad. He's upset. He doesn't want that. And the last thing we ought to want to do is grieve God. It also says to quench not the spirit. Quench not the spirit. It's like throwing water on a fire. That's how you quench it. Now I believe the Holy Spirit ought to burn like a fire in the heart of all believers. We should never, ever, ever do anything to dampen it or put it out. And when we don't grieve the Spirit or quench the Spirit, then we walk in the Spirit like we should. The Bible also says that we are to walk in the newness of life. How do you do that? Where did our new life come from? Our new life, I don't care how long ago it was, but our new life came from Jesus Christ. That's our new life. It came from that man, all man, all God, came when he died on the cross and was raised from the dead. And that gave us the opportunity to die to our old lives and obtain a new life in Christ. In other words, he died so we don't have to face eternal damnation with him. We have a new life that will last forever. The Bible also says we are also to walk by faith. Walk by faith. My faith is in Jesus Christ alone. That's it. I have faith in him to take care of me and all of his followers. 
it may not take care of us in the same way. But he will take care of us. I have faith in him to do it because I believe in him. I have no doubts. I believe in what he's done. And I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. I found life to be a lot easier if you truly believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. We're also told to walk worthy of the Lord. I think that has to do with Christian character. If you're going to be a Christian, act like a Christian. Huh? We got too many Christians who are playing a different part. They're like heathens, except for an hour on Sunday morning if they have time. If there's not a conflict, they might be in church. But the rest of the time, they live like a heathen. Walk in a way, which means live in a way. Live in a way that would please God. Does that sound difficult to you? Then you've got a problem. Is what you did the last week pleasing to him? Is what you did yesterday pleasing to him? Is what you have scheduled for tomorrow pleasing to him? The Bible also says to walk in love. Jesus' love is our example. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's very plain. Very plain. Jesus is our example. How did he love? <clears throat> one word agape that's it that means no strings attached that, meant, uh, that just means no strings attached that'd be like me saying I love my wife if she makes enchiladas on Sunday night no <laughs> you know I love Ronnie as as long as he's nice to me. <laughs> I, you know, there's always something attached with people. Always. A copy of love means there are no strings attached. Jesus loves you regardless. And we are to walk in the light. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. You know, I think the people who enjoy that song more than any other are the ones who truly walked in darkness. I know what the darkness looks like. I spent most of my life in darkness. I'm thrilled when we talk about the light. I collect lighthouses and pictures of lighthouses because I love the symbolism of the dark sea and the dark light and a lighthouse with a beacon. To me, Jesus is the lighthouse. We are to walk in light. We should have nothing to do with darkness anymore. And then I jotted down one final. To grow, we must know how to reproduce. Mm -hmm. 
John 15 says, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. You know what the fruit of a Christian is? It's another Christian. That's it. Early believers kept multiplying. You know what the same thing happens today? It's a domino effect. Always has been. The early believers <clears throat> terrified the Romans, scared the leaders, the Pharisees, all of them were scared. You know why? Because they were multiplying over and over and over. <clears throat> That's the same thing that works today. One gets saved, then their family gets saved, and their friends come to Christ, and on and on and on it goes. Reproducing. If you and I want to truly grow spiritually, if we really want to, I believe I've shared with you four categories that will help immensely. Our devotion our worship, our walk, and our witness. How do you measure up? I think it's time we all grew up. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for bringing us together this morning. I pray especially for those not with us today because of illness. Lord, I truly want to grow up spiritually. Some of us are old and either worn out or getting worn out physically. But we never, ever, ever ought to wear out spiritually. Help us to help each other. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.